Dzień dobry Państwu. Ja się nazywam Agnieszka Liszka, jestem współzałożycielką wydawnictwa Kurhaus Publishing. I w imieniu swoim i swojej wspólniczki chciałam Was bardzo serdecznie przywitać. To jest nasze pierwsze spotkanie autorskie, <głos> więc dziękujemy. Ono nie byłoby możliwe, gdyby nie grono partnerów. I bardzo chciałabym podziękować Uniwersytetowi Warszawskiemu, który jest naszym gospodarzem, Europejskiemu Forum Nowych Idei, które odbywa się w Sopocie, firmie Samsung, Instytutowi Spraw Publicznych, który jest naszym partnerem, a także y, uczelniom, które organizują y, wystąpienie pana profesora Sandela we Wrocławiu, Papieskiemu Wydziałowi Teologicznemu i Politechnice Wrocławskiej. Mamy też partnerów medialnych i dzisiaj muszę im podziękować. Gazeta Wyborcza, Kultura Liberalna, Republika Nowa, dziękujemy. I jeszcze raz bardzo dziękuję, że jesteście. Oddaję głos naszemu gospodarzowi, pan profesor Alojzy Nowak. Pani Agnieszko, should I speak in English or in Polish? Well, anyway, some words may be in English and then in Polish. Good afternoon, everybody. Warsaw University is more than pleased. I am also more than pleased that we have such eminent professor, eminent economist, and eminent human being, Professor Sander of Harvard University. Professor Sandel, welcome. There are many extremely good universities in Poland, but we think that you are, we are the best, so we are at the best university. <laughs> There is a lot of discussion going on just now. I will be not speaking long, don't worry, please. About society, about economy, and about the future of the world, of Europe, of America, of Poland. There are at least two viewpoints. Number one is very liberal, which is underlining that there is nothing more important than invisible hand of the market. And there is another viewpoint, which is saying something different. Sometimes it's called post-Keynesian economy. Some, sometimes it is said that it's behavioral economy, which is looking for and other solutions or which is looking a little bit for some limitations of the market. And we are more than happy and grateful that you came to us because in this country, in our country, in Poland, we have had as well similar discussions. They are going, they are taking place at the universities. They are taking place on the radio, on TV, and in the newspapers. And I think that in particular among young generation, they are divided, I don't know, in 50-50 or maybe 60-40. So you will have a responsibility work together because you maybe will change the proportion. And, but anyway, you will change or you will not change. Your voice is expected very much here because we know you from the publications. We know your approach. We know your methodology at least a little bit. And we know how much you are appreciated by Harvard and not Harvard students. So, Professor Sandel, welcome. The floor is yours. I see, movie will be Agnieszka is showing me that first movie and then Professor Sandel. So movie and the floor will be in a minute or two minutes yours. Thank you very much. What's the right thing to do? That's a question I've asked thousands of students at Harvard University in my class, Justice. Would it be just to torture the suspect to get the information? 
Do you think that a person with a bad parent owes them less? Is it all right to steal a drug that your, your child needs to survive? My name is Michael Sandell. And over the years, thousands of students have joined me for an ongoing debate about the moral decisions we face in our everyday lives. This is a course about justice, and we begin with a story. Suppose you're the driver of a trolley car. Nikolai, if you didn't think you'd get caught, would you pay your taxes? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Do I think I should be able to bid for a baby? I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a market, I mean. In a situation that desperate, you have to do what you have to do to survive. Um, you have to do what you have to do. You have, gotta do what you gotta do. What do you say to Marcus? I've never been in a class like this before, where they kind of asked you to, to, to really think and consider the, the moral dilemma. I've never had such a fun class in my life, you know? We turn to the great philosophers of our past for answers. Do you think Bentham is wrong to add up the collective happiness? I don't think he's wrong, but I think murder is murder in any case. Yeah, well, then Bentham has to be wrong. If you're right, he's wrong. Okay, then he's wrong. All right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. And we turn to the present to challenge the reasoning behind the moral choices we make every day. I think that what happened in the past has no bearing on what happens today, and I think that discriminating based on race should always be wrong. So I just want to say that white people have had their own affirmative action in this country for more than 400 years. It's called nepotism and quid pro quo. So there's nothing wrong with correcting the injustice and discrimination that's been done to black people for 400 years. Even effort depends a lot on fortunate family circumstances for which we can claim no credit. Raise your hand, those of you here who are first in birth order. I am too, by the way. Mike, I noticed you raised your hand. Taking justice was really an eye-opening experience for me. Everything that you've thought of up to that point becomes questioned, becomes challenged. The purpose of sex is one, for its procreative um, uses, and two, for a unifying purpose between a man and a woman. Your beliefs are your beliefs, and that's fine. But civil union is not marriage within the Catholic Church. What is the right thing to do? People have been arguing for, for millennia, really, uh, and there's still not one definite answer. Um, and in ways that's, that makes philosophy impossible, but it makes it beautiful at the same time that we're still debating similar questions. And the reason they're unavoidable, the reason they're inescapable, is that we live some answer to these questions every day. And now, I had the chance to invite you to join us as Harvard opens its classroom to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome and thank you to the Vice Rector for hosting us here. And it's a special, this is my second visit to Poland. I was last here about six or seven years ago. It's a special privilege and an honor to be here just at the time, here in Warsaw, when you've been celebrating the 25th anniversary of the events of 1989 and of solidarity. And I know that it's a time of reflection about the past 25 years, a reflection on democracy, on democratic capitalism, and also on the role of markets, of money in markets. And we were having some conversations earlier today, and one of the questions I was asked was, here Poland has just had 25 years of tremendous success with democratic capitalism, and 
we're now here at a time celebrating that success. And here I come uh, from America uh, saying that there are moral limits to markets. How do those two facts fit together? And I, I'm not sure of the answer to that question. I think it's a good question, and I hope that you will join me in thinking it through. If you look around the world today, at democracies around the world, there is a striking similarity for all their differences. And that is a widespread frustration with politics and with politicians and political parties. In almost every democracy around the world, people don't really feel that politics and politicians are addressing questions that matter. I think people are frustrated rightly by what they see as a certain emptiness in the terms of public discourse. There's a hollowness to the way we argue about politics. So much of political discourse these days consists of narrow managerial technocratic talk. And when passion enters, it's usually in the form of of shouting matches, people shouting past one another without really listening. We've lost the ability, or so it seems, to argue together and to reason together, to deliberate about big questions, especially questions of ethics and values. We're not very good at debating large questions about justice and the common good and what it means to be a citizen. And I think one of the reasons for this may be the, the prominence of market thinking and market reasoning is, is if we could outsource our moral judgments and social choices to the operation of markets. I think another reason for this emptiness is that we hesitate to engage in ethical arguments in politics because we know we live in pluralist societies. We know we disagree about moral and spiritual questions. And so there's a temptation to say, let's avoid those questions in politics because we will inevitably disagree. And let's try to find a way to decide what the law should be and what economic policy should be in a way that is neutral with respect to competing moral and spiritual convictions. And so we ask democratic citizens to leave their moral and convictions outside when they enter the public square. It's understandable, but I think this impulse is also a mistake. It's a mistake because it leads to the emptiness of our politics. People want public debate, democratic debate, to be about bigger things. And so today I would like to invite you to join me in a discussion of one of the big ethical questions we face in democratic societies. What should be the role of money and markets in a good society? Today there are very few things that money can't buy. If you were ever sentenced to a jail term in Santa Barbara, California, if that should ever happen to you, you should know that if you don't like the jail, you can, and if you have the money, you can buy a prison cell upgrade. For how much do you suppose? What would you guess? Anybody? $100 a day? It's about that. It's about that. $90 a night. There's a charity that tries to solve, that tries to use a market mechanism to solve a pressing social problem. Each year, thousands of babies are born to drug-addicted women. And so the charity tries to address this tragedy by using a cash incentive. They offer $300 to any woman, willing, any drug-addicted woman, willing to be sterilized. It's the use of a market mechanism to solve a social problem. Looking at larger institutions, we see the rise in some countries, including my own, of for-profit schools, prisons, and hospitals. 
The way we fight our wars reflects this growing reliance on market thinking. In Iraq and Afghanistan, there were more private military contractors on the ground than there were U.S. military troops. This isn't because we had a public debate about whether we wanted to outsource war to private companies, but this is what has happened. Over the past three decades, in many democratic societies, we've drifted, almost without realizing it, from having market economies to becoming market societies. The difference is this. A market economy is a tool, a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. Market economies have brought economic growth, rising prosperity and affluence to countries around the world. And we know the success story of market reforms in Poland over the last 25 years. But a market society is different. A market society is a place where almost everything is up for sale. It's a way of life in which market values and market thinking increasingly reach in to almost every sphere of life. Family life and personal relations, health, education, journalism, civic life, politics, law. And so the question is, should we worry should we worry about this tendency? And if so, why? On what grounds? And that's the question I would like to discuss with you today. Now, let's begin with a question that in some ways gets to the heart of the ethics of, of the market, of the law of supply and demand. Let's imagine a store that sells snow shovels for $10 a piece. And one day in the middle of winter, there's a great blizzard. Everyone is buried in snow. Demand for snow shovels increases, and so the shop increases the price of snow shovels from $10 to $20. Let's first see what people think by a show of hands. How many think it's unfair doubling the price of snow shovels after the snowstorm? And how many people think it's, it's fair? That's the way markets should operate. Uh, let's first see, how many people think it's unfair? Raise your hand. Doubling the price of the snow shovel. And how many think it's okay? It's a legitimate use of a market mechanism. The last time I saw a vote this strongly pro-market was with a similar group of students in Shanghai. <laughs> All right, now let's investigate. Let's, let's hear first from those of you those of you in the brave minority who object, who think this is unfair, on what grounds do you object? Who will get our discussion going? Put up your hand and we'll get you a microphone. Those of you who, someone who thinks it's unfair. Yes, in the middle. It tell, yes, start by telling us your name. I think we have people who have microphones. Can we pass a microphone to this person here? Oh, hi, my name is Michael. Yeah. And I just think it's uh, when people need shovels, everybody needs shovels equally. Yeah. And so to increase the price of a shovel is just not not right when everybody needs needs a shovel to move the snow. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So who um, who disagrees with Michael and can tell us why he's why well, he's mistaken. Yes. Hello, my name is Iga and I disagree with him because I guess this is some quite well known mechanism with supply and demand. Right. And I guess it depends of the effect, what happens to you if you cannot afford to buy the device. 
Well, it's, what does happen, do you assume, in this scenario? Well, there are lots of different devices, maybe a little bit cheaper, I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, with easier access. I don't think you will like die what? with that. Like what? Like you have lots of solutions. You can borrow that from your neighbor, for example, or maybe you can use the one you have in the basement, I don't know. You don't have to, you don't have to buy it if you cannot afford that. You can use the snow shovel you conveniently already own in your basement. <laughs> well, maybe you wanted to have a new one, the harder one, I don't know. Yeah. I just think it's fair, so, because there are some who are willing to pay that much. Right. If you cannot afford that, you're supposed to just look for another solution. Right. That's all. So, if it were, suppose it were not $20 but $30, that would still be okay? Well, if there is someone who wish to pay that much. Or 100 Still, there are some goods, like yes. with the... The, um, the most expensive, the more people want to get them. Yes. And there are some, well, probably that kind of device is not one of that extra luxury goods, but. Right. It's the legitimate operation of the market principle. The demand goes up. Snow shovels can now be sold for 20 or $30. Those who can't afford one can make do in other ways. Who disagrees with Iga and has a a reply in the, in the balcony in the front. First, t Hi. tell us your name. You think it's unfair? Yeah. All right, uh, wait. All right. Tell us your name and speak directly to Iga. See if you can persuade her. My name is Philip, and I think the, the guy who owns the shop with the shovels shouldn't uh, use the environment and the weather change changes uh, to get more profit. Because before the snow came, he already had a markup on the shovels that was enough for him to survive. So why would he use the environment and the weather changes just to get more money? I mean, people, if they want to survive, they would use their own hands to get the snow out of the house. So they didn't have to buy the shovel. But if they can, and they always did for a 10 bucks, why would, should they pay right now 20? It's just, you know, he's... He's already have a, have a really good business going on because the snow came. All right, stay, stay there. Iga, what do you say? Well, I guess it's all about being smart. Well, you observe that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not like directly to you. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's okay. But the question was not about being smart, it's about being fair. You can be smart in business, but not fair for people and not gentle. Well,. I don't think it's not fair, actually. Well, mainly because it's totally replaceable, that kind of good. So if you cannot afford that, you can go to other shop. That's how competition works, actually. You can try to sell your shop for, like, for about $5. You may see what happened. Maybe you will sell more than I do, but... I, I think, uh, if I may reply... Yes, go ahead, and we'll give this microphone to you. I think that it would be fair only if uh, there was a, two shops in a town that sell shovels, and they would make a competition out of it, and the better quality or the lower price will win. All if right. it's the only one, I think that's not fair. Okay, now, uh, Philip, I, I thought maybe you would try to press your point by offering a harder example to Iga and those, the majority, who th say it is fair. Let's shift the example slightly. What about... Uh, suppose it wasn't a snowstorm. Let's say it was a flood or a hurricane or a typhoon or a tornado, and it, the fresh water supply were unavailable for a time, and the store increased, let's say that, that bottled water sold for $1 before, and they increased the price of bottled water to $10. How many think that would be unfair. More, how many think that would be okay? Now the sentiment seems to have shift, shifted and even Iga has voted that this is unfair. Who among those who have shifted when the example changed who can explain why he or she shifted? Why is that? What is the difference?
between uh, snow shovel and bottled water. Yes, the woman sitting on the aisle down. All right, go My ahead. name is Anastasia, and um, I think in the second case, uh, human life is, a, is at stake. So um, in that case, it would be um, not fair to raise the price and put some other human being in danger. So if human life is at stake, the market is an inappropriate way of allocating goods? Well, um, I guess so, because uh, human life is the, um, the biggest treasure. So I think in this case, the rules can be changed. All right, now, and what's your name? Uh, Anastasia. Anastasia. So Anastasia thinks that the, the fairness of markets changes if it's bottled water. Human life is at stake. Who disagrees? Who was a consistent defender of the market in both of these cases and can respond? Yes. I mean, but the thing is... Stand, stand up and tell us okay. your name. So my name is Kuba, and my point is that the amount of water is fixed anyway. So you have to find a way to uh, divide this water you have among, among these people. Because the only reason why you can uh, make prices so high is because uh, the amount of water is, is limited. And, and well, my, my point is that you can't give this uh, water to everyone, so you have to find a way to... Uh, to somehow distribute it in this in this uh, society, right. but when you distribute it in a in a market way, you kind of well, it's it's uh, for certain Pareto efficient because this it's this Pareto person who, efficient. yes Pareto efficient. efficient because this person who who has bought this water and 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 had had, had buy it has has a profit, but. The, way you distribute it doesn't, I mean, well, I would defend marketing in this way, but uh, I would But I wait, would let's say stick to the water. The supply of water is limited. It has to be distributed yes. in some way. Distributing it based on the, the market, yes. who's willing to pay the most for the water, is an efficient way of distributing the water. Yes. And therefore, it's, it's fair? Well, are you saying it's efficient and also fair, or are efficiency and fairness one and the same thing? Well, I think uh, when you have, when I'm sorry, when you have a, a fixed uh, amount of people who can get this water anyway, I mean, we, I mean, you can't think about this that uh, giving this water to this certain people right. is more fair than giving it it to this certain uh, group group of people. Right. But when someone will be without water, so we may as well yes. allocate water based on the ability to pay. Exactly. All right. Who has who disagrees and has a reply? Yes. Yes, so uh, my name is Conrad. I do agree with the idea of raising the price of the water, although I do not agree with the statement that was faced here, because I think that uh, here we, sh we are supposed to divide the market from the, what is supposed to do the government and what is supposed to do the private sector. The government is supposed to give the water to the all the people, but we as the private uh, distributors of the bottled water, we are obliged to, not obliged, but we are supposed to give the price which we like. So if we would like to raise the water from one dollar to even twelve dollars per bottle, we are obliged to do that. We can't do that because we are serving the people that are able to pay for the twelve bottle water which is not served by the government. So you think the government should step in and buy water for people who can't afford it? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, in, in a way, because uh, if we are limited in the supplies of the water, then the, the water is compliant by the government, which is given to the people who are not able to uh, afford the water, right, which right. we are saying. All right, so thank you for that. The shopkeeper, who, 
Who else thinks it's unfair for the shopkeeper to increase the price of water? Yes, the woman in the front. My name is Anita, uh, and uh, I am extremely against using just supply and demand for everything. And in, in first example and second example, uh, why I think so is that uh, just earlier you mentioned that market should be a tool to ensure prosperity for people, and people are the highest good. So if we are trying to raise money uh, and just to kill others, I don't think that that's the right use of market or supply and demand. I so, think we should... Oh. Go ahead. I think we should distinguish between need and want. Something that we need should be given for us and something that we want, it should be uh, shared in a different way. Right. So you think where fundamental human needs are at stake, markets are not the right way to allocate goods. Exactly. Would you say the same then about um, access to health care or to a doctor? Well, I think it should be free. <laughs> and that's because health care you consider a fundamental human need and therefore markets are inappropriate? Exactly. Well, I mean, it depends which kind of health care. If you want some implants or, you know, plastic surgery, right. I don't think it's necessary. No, right. you should pay for that. Right. But if your life is in danger, all right. it should be. Okay. Very good. Let, all right, thank you for that. This discussion about the ethics of supply and demand uh, brings out one of the fundamental features of debates about the ethics of markets, namely that at least for some, whether markets are appropriate for the allocation of goods depends on the character of the good and its role in either meeting a fundamental human need or its role perhaps in, the, in social inclusion, the fundamental life of the society. There are others who say, no, it's not really for us to discriminate among goods. Markets are efficient ways of allocating scarce goods. And whenever goods are scarce, whether they be shovels or, or bottled water, Markets are the way of getting goods to the people who most value them at least as measured by the ability and the willingness to pay. Right, Kuba? Yeah? Okay. So we have these two different views about the ethics of supply and demand, but the logic of markets goes beyond questions of supply and demand. Let's take an example that does not involve life and death but an example of a good that is nonetheless very important, much desired, let's say access to a great university like this one. Now, the seats are typically allocated according to academic merit as measured by an exam. Am I right about that? Now, let's suppose there were, the, there were a student who was not very strong academically, who didn't score well on the exams, but whose parents came to the vice rector and said, it seems to me the university needs a new library. <laughs> and I'm willing to give $4 million. Is that enough to build a new library? <laughs> no, he wants it. He's a tough bargainer. $8 million for a new library, uh, provided my son or daughter is admitted. Now, let's suppose you are the vice rector, and you have to decide what is the right thing to do. How many would say the right thing to do would be to accept the money and admit the student? Raise your hand. And how many would not? Wow, 
They are young, says the vice rector. <laughs> now, so most people now are against the use of a market mechanism to allocate a much desired social good. A few people are for it. Kuba, I didn't, I didn't see how you voted. What did you say? You would accept the money. Everyone benefits from the library, so it's worth it. It's worth it. All right. Now let's hear from someone who objects. The majority object. Who objects and can tell us and can tell us why? Yes. The woman sitting in the middle. Yeah. Hi, my name's Anna, and my question is what, well, short term, mm, <laughs> short term uh, benefit sounds quite good. Short term benefit, the library will be there for yeah. years and generations. Well, <laughs> it might be, but what generation is going to learn from those books? And my question is what in the long run? In the long run, maybe a lot of students will learn from those books. What students, if you can buy the status of, of a student? Ah, uh, you think that lesser students will be learning from those books? I think they but would be students just by the label, but not real students. Not real students. Why? What are real students like? Why is someone whose position is bought not a real student? Well, a student is someone who is supposed to be learning. Yeah. Not buying the status of the student. Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. So, so what do you do at Harvard <laughs> with those cases? <laughs> Luckily, I'm not in charge of these decisions. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who... Um, who else objects? Who else thinks it's wrong? Yes, in the balcony. Hello, my name is Eva, and I believe that accepting this cash grant would not be fair because I expect from the description of fact that it would be against the social arrangements. Because against, I believe wait, wait, against the social so arrangements. What arrangements do you mean? or general believeness of all people who try to have place at the university that uh, only their personal skills or knowledge matters. Because I understand that only in this case we would have this question. Because in case in, our syst in, in your system or in your example, yeah. it would be obvious that you can either be the student of the university if you pass the e exams right. or if your parents or family or someone else will grant certain cash to the university, right. it would be fair. But I believe that it's unfair if you do not agree with all candidates what are the rules of being the students at this university. Well, there are two rules, just as you yeah. described. Either you have to score very high on the exam, mm -hmm. or you have to have a very wealthy parent willing to, to buy a library. Okay, so if this is a case... And, and those rules apply to everyone. Okay, so in such description, I believe it would be fair to give certain amount of places to the students who do not pass the exam, but they give a grant to the university. But uh, I would expect that all the rules are publicly announced and uh, clear for everyone in the given society. And of course, it would be a huge discussion what should be the ratio of the students who are... All right, fair enough. Yeah. So the ratio might matter, but if yeah. we keep the ratio of the bought places small, let's say five a year, then that would be all right? That would be fair? Uh, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, if I would be the person who would take this decision, I would accept this ratio. You would accept? Yes, I would accept. All right, now let's hear from someone who would not accept, who thinks it's wrong, and who can explain why. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think it's my name is Robert, and I think it's wrong because, for example, let's say this test will say this person is dumb and stupid. Let's say, and if we know that there will be one dumb student, student, yes, and very good library, so it's unfair because we start from one dumb stu uh, student who will not take anything from this library because we know, for example, that he's this. Stupid person. So well, let's wait, wait, wait. You're being a little and harsh. Now it's You're being a little bit too harsh. I mean, maybe, maybe yes, but let's say an this average test. student, an average Other student students. who wouldn't otherwise be admitted, uh, but who can still manage to do the work, not maybe to a high standard, but who can do the work and get by. And by the way, you don't know who among your classmates was admitted under this system. They don't have to wear a sign saying. Yeah, I know. I, I, I was admitted because my parents bought the library. We don't require... Yeah. So yes, what, what's wrong with it? It's wrong that it's not just fair for the people who work hard, get, get to this, you know, university, and, you know, there is one place less for this one person who worked so hard to get there. So now we have one person who didn't work hard, yes? And the student who work hard yeah. and can make a profit for country, have for everybody. Right. So it would would it bother you? You worked hard, you scored high in the test. For example, me. I'm just you know. You're already guy. in. You're already in. So why would it bother you? This is interesting to know that somewhere, somewhere sitting maybe in this room, <laughs> is a person who didn't score that well, but whose parents gave a lot of money. Why would that bother you? Because it's not his fault, first of all, but it's just bad for this one person who will not get on the, to the university. Yes. Go ahead. We got it. Okay, so my name is Agata, and I'm just wondering if. Um, the question of morality should be dismissed in this case, but we are still arguing that we wouldn't like to know who, or maybe the person who is admitted on the grounds of donating money, right. wouldn't want to be known for that. He should, he would want to be, you know, blurred in the in the crowd, and right. nobody knows if he's here because he's a genius or because his parents bought the library. Right. So. Um, I guess that this proves, in a way, that we somehow feel that this is morally wrong to um, to get admitted on the basis of money to the you know top schools. The very fact that we want to keep it quiet. We want to keep it quiet, and we also want the ratio to be like five percent of five five people uh, in comparison to maybe a hundred. Right. And if we really believe that it was fair, we would say 50-50, uh -huh. I guess. Okay, so all right, this is interesting. There's, there seem to be two different objections to putting admission to the university up for sale. One objection has to do with fairness. It doesn't seem fair that those applicants who happen to have the good judgment to be born to wealthy parents get an advantage. That seems unfair. But there's a different objection, which has to do with what's worthy of honor and recognition. What represents the virtue that university admission honors and rewards? This is the argument we heard that Universities are for the sake of promoting and recognizing and honoring scholarly excellence and academic achievement. And somehow it's at odds with that purpose for admission to be allocated in a way that's unrelated to that purpose. So what these two different reasons suggest is that when it comes to deciding when market mechanisms are appropriate and when they're not, there are, we have to ask two questions, not one. We have to ask the question, is it fair to those who can't afford it? Is it fair to those people who can't afford a snow shovel? We debated that. 
What about those people who can't afford the expensive bottled water? Is it unfair to them? That's one objection. But what the university admission example brings out is that there is a further question, and that is, what is the appropriate way of valuing certain goods and social practices, in this case, universities? And the answer to that question seems to depend on how properly to conceive the purpose or the point or the role of the social good or social practice. That's the argument that says universities are for the sake of scholarly excellence. So the fairness argument and what we might call, what's the second, a name for the second argument, a teleological argument, an argument in the name of the character of the good or purpose. Both questions have to be asked and answered before we can decide where is it appropriate to use a market. I want to put a very different kind of market mechanism, put to you the, the ca a case of the use of a cash incentive to motivate learning. So uh, this isn't to do with the allocation of scarce goods. It's to do with the use of a cash incentive. Many schools struggle with the problem of how to motivate kids to study hard, to get good grades. Some kids come from families that emphasize teaching and learning and studying and reading from the start. Other kids don't. Some school districts, with the help of economists, have experimented with offering cash incentives for kids, especially from disadvantaged backgrounds, to study hard. Cash for good grades or high test scores. $50 for an A, $35 for a B. They've tried this in New York, in Chicago, in Washington, D.C., in Dallas, Texas. They have a program that offers young kids, eight-year-olds, $2 for each book they read. Now, suppose you're the head of one of these schools. You're trying to motivate kids to achieve, to study hard. This proposal is brought to you. Let's assume it's independently funded. You don't even have to pay for it out of your own budget. How many think it would be worth a try? And how many object in principle? Let's see, first, those of you who think it's worth a try. Cash for good grades or reading books. And how many would reject it? Wouldn't even. So the majority actually reject it, though not everyone voted this time. Why, those of you who would reject it, why? On what grounds? Yes. Okay, good. So my name is Andrew, or if I were to translate it, because it's Yendre, but it's like kind of hard to pronounce it. Okay, thank you for that. So I would reject that idea for like one simple reason. Yeah. Because I think that later on in real life, yeah. there is like no motivation in money for people. I mean, you get paid for your job. Yeah, what about that? But it's, it's a little bit different because if you pay kids for reading books, for having good grades and stuff, they think that it's your duty to pay them if they, good, if, if they do something that should be obligatory for them. And I believe that employers wouldn't be so eager to reward their employees so much for every single thing that they do more, let's say, above the standard of, yeah. they should do, of what they should do. Right. So I believe it, it just wouldn't work in later life and it would just... So paying, the, what bothers you is paying for something that should be obligatory. Yeah, that's what Namely I'm studying to say. hard. Well, and if you do pay them, what, what happens? What's the danger? What's the risk? Why not try it? If you pay them? Yeah. Well, that's pretty much what I said. If you pay them, you learn the kids the behavior that just won't work in later life. I see. You teach them like, to expect payment for yes, everything they have exactly. to do. Exactly. And then I, I just don't think like with market and employers who want to, right. who want to have control over their right. employees. I just, so it would, I be just as if, it would be as if I were paid 
eat a little bit more each time I walked into the classroom. Exactly, or for every single word that you say. Every more single and... word. Do you know that Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations proposed the idea of paying professors according to the number of students who come to their lectures? Don't you think that's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, by the way. I don't really. Yeah, well, it, you know, you, you need to give us your opinion on that. Because you <laughs> okay. have like, experience and... All right. Yes, what do you think? And I may I disagree with you, although I see, you totally see your point. Say, I think. say start again. Now that so, my name is Barbara, and I understand what you're saying, but I think uh, that we're... Now we're living in a very materialistic world when children, they need a kind of incentive to do something and to, and this, I think, paying them for reading a book and motivating them by that way and maybe, you know, for, even for a short period of time, just, you know, put an incentive, I think that's a great idea. And if someone paid me for reading books, I probably read much more books. I didn't really? read a lot, unfortunately, because that was my, I think that was kind of, I was looking for kind of motivation to do that, and if someone gives me like two dollars for one book to read, I would get a bit interested in it, and then I would read more and more. And I think that would, might be very helpful in these years. Okay, so Barbara thinks it would help. Barbara thinks it would help. Yes, what do you say? You disagree. I want to hear from someone who disagrees with Barbara. Yes. Hello, my name is Robert, and I don't uh, agree with this idea because um, I'm quite sure that when we start to give money f to kids for good grades, they will try to cheat the system. So okay, they will they cheat the system. Yes, they will start to cheat. They won't. They will try to score the best grade to get money. So they will focus on getting the grades, not on learning. They will start to cheat. They won't really focus on the whole aspect. They will just learn for the next test. They so learning and reading will become instrumental rather than valuable in themselves? Yes. And they will also uh, cheat from each other. They will do some notes. They will try to cheat the system right. if they get paid. But, and, and students in school who are trying for good grades, they don't cheat now without being paid? They do, but they will cheat more. More. For example, <laughs> I don't really cheat or I try not to cheat, but... Those, those are two different statements. <laughs> but if I, were, if I were getting paid for good grades, I would probably cheat. You would? Yes. Were you ever paid by your parents or anybody for doing well in school? Pardon? Were you ever paid by your parents? No. Wait, sir, how many here were paid by their, as a reward if you did well in school? Anybody? Wojtek, you really did? Wojtek is the guy who was in the film. You stand up so people can see. There's Wojtek. <laughs> your parents paid you? <laughs> It was really small amounts of money um, at a very early stage of education, I guess. But, but he yeah, did I, end I, up at Harvard, but I, here's but, what I want to know, Wojtek. Yeah, did yeah, you but, get paid for doing well in justice at Harvard? No, I, no, I didn't. No, I, but I did b bought your book. <laughs> I did buy your book. I bought your book. I did buy your book. Okay. Um, and I, I find it really cool. Uh, and okay. I, no, I really, no, really, really. And, and then I actually, I do, I do, I have a moral problem with paying for grants, so I do, I do have that. All right, so Full you're disclosure. against, you're against even though you were paid a little even bit, accused Even though I was paid and it seems to somehow work right. a little, then... It I'm works, actually what happened, thank you for that, I, 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 very few people were paid here, but here's another question. How many people here would be willing to pay or have paid your own children if they do well, to motivate them in school, reward? Raise your hands. I wonder if there's a shift. Not too many so far. I should tell you actually what happened with these experiments. The cash, the cash for good grades did not really seem to increase the academic performance. 
But paying those kids $2 to read books did lead them to read more books. It also led them to read shorter books. <laughs> but the real question is the one that's come out in our discussion, and that is, what will become of these kids later? The objection, it's worth identifying a feature of the objection that a number of you have raised. The objection here does not seem to be about fairness. The objection here seems to be a worry about corrupting the activity or the social practice. The worry that if you pay kids to read books, the lesson they will learn is that books are, reading is a chore to be done for money. And if that's the lesson they learn, many people worry, the money will crowd out or corrupt the higher motivation, namely the love of learning or reading for their own sake, the intrinsic love of reading and learning. So this is another instance, this debate, of something we saw earlier with the university admission question, that in order to decide whether to use a market mechanism, we have to ask, what are the attitudes and norms that we want to cultivate and promote and encourage, in this case, the love of learning. And might it be that the market mechanism may erode or undermine those norms, corrupt the character of the good in question? So this is an example of the argument from a certain conception of the good. Actually, a friend of mine pays his young kids a dollar for each thank you note they write if someone's taken them out to dinner or sent them a gift. I've received some of these thank you notes. <laughs> and I can tell by reading them that they were written under a certain pressure. <laughs> but the real question that I wonder about, my wife and I look askance at this practice. We wonder how these kids will turn out. Now, it could be that by writing thank you notes for pay, they get in the habit of writing thank you notes and continue doing it even when no one is paying them and figure out the real reason, the higher motivation, namely the expression of gratitude, in which case all will be well. Or it could turn out that the lesson they're being taught is that the reason to write a thank you note is to get a dollar and if that's what they learn when the money stops, so will the thank you notes. And they may find it difficult ever to learn the virtue of gratitude, in which case the practice, the cash payment, will have corrupted their moral education. It's hard to know in advance, but what these stories illustrate is that markets and market mechanisms are not neutral. Sometimes they change the meaning of the goods being exchanged. Some economy, there, was a, there were some daycare centers in Israel that had a familiar problem. Parents coming late to pick up their children a teacher had to stay with the kids who, whose parents were late. And so, with the help of some economists, they devised a solution. They established a fine for parents who came late to pick up their children. What do you suppose happened? More, more parents came late. More parents came late. Now, from the standpoint of standard economic analysis, this is a paradox. Normally, if you charge a price or increase the price for something, fewer people, not more people, will do that thing. Here it was the opposite. So what happened? Well, what happened was the money, the payment, changed the norms, changed the attitude, changed the meaning of showing up late. Before, when people came late, they felt guilty. They were imposing upon the teacher. They felt a sense of obligation to show up on time. Now, once they could pay a fine, they treated the fine as if it were a fee, and the guilt went away. Now, coming late, paying a certain amount was like hiring a babysitting service. So why feel guilty? What's interesting is not only did the monetary payment change the attitude toward the, the practice, when they realized what had happened, they tried to change it back. They removed the fine. But the heightened, the heightened late arrival behavior 
persisted, which suggests that once certain attitudes and norms, sense of obligation, are eroded, it's not so easy just to turn them back on again. Another study was done of Donation Day. In Israel every year, high school students go door to door raising funds for charity. One year, some economists did an experiment. They divided the students into three groups. The first group was given a short speech about the importance of the charitable causes for which they were raising money. And the, they sent the group on their way. Second group was given the same speech and offered a 1% commission on all the funds they raised. The third group, same speech, but was offered a 10% commission on all the money they raised for charity. Which group do you think raised the most money? The third? The first? The second. <laughs> Just a little bit of commission. The first group raised the most money. Now, it is true that the market principle, the price effect, held to this extent. The third group raised more than the second. Once you start paying a commission, you better pay, a, pay enough. They raised more. But the first group paid no commission, raised more even than those who got a 10% commission. Here, too, is an anomaly from the standpoint of standard economic analysis. Well, what happened? What explains it? It seems that introducing the cash incentive, the commission, changed the meaning of the activity. What had been a moral and civic project now became a job, a transaction, a financial deal. And so once money entered, the attitude and value, the intrinsic motivations, at least to some extent, fell away. Well, what are the moral, what's the moral of all of these stories, the debates we've had, these experiments in the effect of market practices in social life? I think one conclusion we can draw is that contrary to what much economic analysis assumes, markets are not inert. Economists often assume that markets are inert in the sense that they do not touch or taint the meaning or the value of the goods they exchange. This may be true in the domain of material goods. Cars, toasters, flat screen televisions. If you sell me a flat screen television or give me one as a gift, it will work just the same either way. The value of the television will not be transformed based on how I acquire it. But the same may not be true when we're talking not about material goods, but about health, education, civic life, culture, family, personal relations. In these domains, what we care about and what animates and governs our responses may be attitudes and values and norms and purposes and ends that may be eroded or corrupted or diminished or crowded out if market values and market principles and market logic enters. So, what is, I think there are two conclusions, that, two implications rather, that follow from this from this power of markets and money to change the meaning of social goods. One is about politics and the other is about economics. I think the implication for politics is we can't decide what should be the proper role of money and markets in our societies without taking up these questions, these ethical questions not only about fairness, but also how to value social practices of the kind we've discussed. And those debates will be contentious. There will be disagreement because they do touch on moral questions about which we disagree, and yet 
if we decide what the role of markets should be, we can't avoid them. That's one conclusion. The second implication is about the way we do economics. In recent decades, economics has been taught and understood as if it were a value-neutral science of human behavior and social choice. But this is a mistake. It's a mistake that we can see once we recognize the importance of attitudes and norms, non-market attitudes and norms, that matter in various domains of social life. If we take this idea seriously, we have to conceive economics, reimagine economics, not as a value-neutral science, but as a branch, as a subfield of moral and political philosophy, which it once was. Back with the classical economists, going back from Adam Smith to Karl Marx to John Stuart Mill, despite their ideological disagreements, they shared the idea, the assumption, that economics is a branch of a larger subject, moral and political philosophy. The subject matter itself was moral and political economy. And so I think we need to recapture that more integrated way of understanding the subject. I'd like to end with one further example. It's about blood, whether blood should be bought and sold, blood for transfusion, or whether it should only be donated. In the 19, around 1970, a British sociologist did a study of blood. Richard Titmus was his name. He compared the system of producing the blood supply in the US and in the UK. In the UK, there was no market in blood. It could only be donated. In the US, it could be either donated or bought and sold. He concluded that on economic grounds, on efficiency grounds, the British system worked better. More stable supply, less uh, tainted blood, and so on. But he also made a moral argument. He said that where blood is bought and sold, it's not it will have an effect on the willingness of people to donate blood. The meaning of, of the altruism embodied in donation of blood will be diminished or tainted or undermined once you have a market in it. That was his argument. And it will undermine, a market in blood will undermine what he called the gift relationship embodied in giving blood. His study was much debated, including by some economists. A famous economist wrote a review, a critical review. Kenneth Arrow, one of the most distinguished American economists of his time. And he disagreed with Titmus. And at the heart of his disagreement was an interesting counter-argument to the critique of markets that Titmus offered and that I've been suggesting. Arrow said, altruism is a scarce good, and so we should do everything we can to conserve it so that it will be available for when we really need it. He said, like many economists, I do not want to rely too heavily on substituting ethics for self-interest. I think it's best on the whole that the requirement of ethical behavior be confined to those circumstances where the price system breaks down. We do not wish to use up recklessly the scarce resources of altruistic motivation. This was Arrow, the great economist. So his idea was that the supply of altruism, generosity, and civic virtue are fixed, as if by nature like the supply of fossil fuels. The more we use, the less we have. And if he's right about this, then it provides a powerful argument for relying as little as possible on altruism, ethics, generosity, rather than markets. The idea, the idea had come from an economist who gave a a lecture in the 1940s, what does the economist economize? And his answer was ultimately love. Love is in scarce supply, altruism is in scarce supply, 
and economics by relying on the price system draws down less quickly the scarce supply of love and virtue and altruism. Now, to those who are not steeped in economics, this way of thinking about generosity is strange. It ignores the possibility that our capacity for love and benevolence is not depleted with use, but enlarged with practice. Think of a loving couple. If over a lifetime they ask little of one another in hopes of hoarding their love, how well would they fare? Wouldn't their love deepen rather than diminish the more they called upon it? Would they really do better to treat one another in more calculating fashion to conserve their love for the times when they really needed it? Similar questions can be asked about social solidarity and civic virtue. A few years ago, a colleague of mine, a distinguished economist at Harvard, was asked to give a, a little talk in the memorial church at morning prayers he reiterated this adage, this folk wisdom. It's not really a postulate of economics, but this conviction about the scarcity of the supply of virtue. He said, we have only so much altruism in us. Economists like me think of altruism as a valuable and rare good that needs conserving. Better that we conserve it by designing a system in which people's wants will be satisfied by people being selfish, so that we can save that altruism for our families, our friends, and the social problems in this world that markets cannot solve. This economistic view of virtue fuels the faith in markets. It propels their reach into places where they don't belong. But the metaphor, the metaphor is misleading. Altruism generosity, solidarity, and civic virtue. These are not like commodities that are depleted with use. They are more, it seems to me, more like muscles that develop and grow stronger with exercise. One of the defects of a market-driven society is that it lets these virtues languish. To renew our public life, to strengthen and deepen democracy, it seems to me we need to exercise these virtues these muscles more strenuously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sandel, for your great presentation, speech, and what is most important, you came back to the roots of economy, to Ricardo Smith, etc. Please accept a small pen from Warsaw University just to sign the checks. And, uh, and I wanted to say one word. Five people left, but they told me that ten came. So it's great success. Usually when I am teaching, 50% is leaving. And, and one more thing. I mean, we had, no, we had in the past year a few Nobel Prize winners giving lectures at Warsaw University. We had advisor to Leszek Balcerowicz, Jeffrey Sachs, but never we had so many students coming and listening for 90 minutes. So it's your great success. Congratulations and all the best. And thank you for coming.
And just now, Professor Sundan agreed to sign some books. If you are wishing, he only for one dollar for one book. Please prepare. Thank you.